that the world was in and sin? Was he the one that was there? Or was that going to happen with him or without? No, I, I don't think it was any um, sin was ever any part of God's plan. Um, he, he foreknew that, that humanity would fall, uh, but that's not to say it had to fall. Um, so, of course, God knew that uh, Satan was going to fall before he made the heavenly host, the divine council, all the angels. So he knew that, and he did it anyway. Um, for his 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 will, his good pleasure. So um, I I think you know it's hard to say. There's there's been a series of rebellions. You have the angelic rebellions, uh, at least two of those, uh, and then you have the fall in the Garden of Eden of humanity. So, um, but none of those rebellions had to happen. Um, either the divine rebellions or the uh, rebellion of humanity because when God made us he said it was very very good um, so it could have stayed that way we had that potential um, and we're going to get back to that God had a plan he was going to do something he wanted to do something he wanted a, a human family to image him and represent him and that's 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 his will and that's the way it's going to work out in the end Yeah, I, th I think heaven is where God lives, and so at the at the time at one we was made to be with Him. Mm -hmm. We're just having a, a little hard time getting there, and what we should have. Had. Yeah, we took a detour. <laughs> we sure we sure did. Yeah, and so thank thankfully we have the gospel, and um, that's what it's all about: is getting back on the right track, the righteousness of God. That's what uh, the Holy Spirit's writing about in Romans. Uh, we're talking about. Uh, salvation, past, present, and, and future, uh, particularly the present tense with sanctification. So if you remember, um, thinking back chapters 4 and 5, the apostle laid out his gospel for us, and he's now in the midst of answering objections to that gospel. Uh, the universal problem is set forth in the first three chapters, so that's sin, that's the fall. Uh, and then the glorious gospel is laid out in chapters 4 and 5, and then, starting in our last chapter, chapter 6, he's anticipating and answering these objections. Uh, so the first objection was that if we're justified apart from the law, won't that result in just moral chaos, right, licentiousness? And Paul says, no, uh, because we've died with Christ in our baptism. Now we come to this new objection, the second objection. It's about uh, how long did the Torah's uh, did the Torah dominate, right? How long was its dominion going to last? Its rule, its reign? Wasn't the law supposed to be permanent? Um, has, has the gospel totally replaced the law or destroyed the law? Um, so God's already answered the initial objections. Um, so more sin for more grace. That's license. It's not for that. Um, in chapter 6, with those three instructions to be heeded each day of our lives, know that we have been crucified with Christ and are dead to sin, reckon that fact to be true in our own life, and then yield our body to the Lord to be used for his glory. In other words, chapter 6 was about uh, how to stop doing bad things. Now he's going to answer this next objection, uh, that these, this, this objection is, sure, we're saved by grace, but now we must live under the law if we're going to please God. So now in chapter 7, Paul's talking about how not to go about doing good things. Okay? So this is a tale of two ditches. Right? Um, liberalism on one side, this idea of an extreme license to sin, versus legalism. Right? But... Um, you have the ditch of liberalism, the ditch of legalism. Right down the middle is the way. That's Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. So God is our destination. Jesus is the road we're traveling on. Faith is the vehicle, and the Holy Spirit is what powers it. Okay? So on one hand, you've got legalism uh, that points its finger and says, God is holy, don't you know? And liberalism says, no, oh, God is love. But the gospel says God is both holy and love. Right. Legalism says, you know, you need to do these things, work this checklist, earn your own righteousness. Liberalism says, you, you, you don't need perfect righteousness. Don't worry about that. The gospel says, receive God's perfect righteousness. 
Legalism says uh, matter is bad, we're all fallen, uh, you need to be suspicious or reject anything uh, that's physical, so asceticism. Liberalism says matter is good, we aren't fallen, so go ahead and, and satisfy all your physical appetites. Well, the gospel says matter is good, the physical world is good, the earth is going to be restored, but we're fallen. Uh, physical enjoyment is good, but we have to live wisely by the Spirit. Legalism says sin only affects individuals, so just, just go out and do evangelism. Uh, liberalism is rather naive about the depth of human sin. Uh, and so it says, we'll just make this world a better place, just do social action. Uh, but the gospel says that sin affects both individuals and systems, so we need to be about the work of evangelizing and engaging with the culture. Legalism says, um, feel the guilt, work out that guilt. Liberalism says, uh, don't worry about guilt, get away from that, convince yourself that you're okay, everything's okay. Uh, the gospel says, uh, get through the guilt and then rest in Jesus Christ. Legalism uh, reminds us to repent of our sins. Liberalism says we don't really need to repent of anything. That's self-righteousness. And the gospel says we need to repent of both sins and self-righteousness. So every growing Christian understands the experience of Romans 6 and 7. Once we learn how to know, reckon, and yield, we start getting victory over the habits of the flesh, and we feel we're becoming more spiritual. We start setting high standards and ideals for ourselves, and for a while it seems we're going to retain them. Then everything falls apart. Everything collapses. We start to see deeper into our own hearts, and we discover sins that we didn't even know were there. Uh, God's holy law takes on a new power, and we wonder if we can ever do anything good. Without realizing it, we have moved into legalism and have learned the truth about sin, the law, and ourselves. So what really is legalism? It's the belief that I can become holy and please God by obeying laws, by doing a checklist of actions. It's measuring spirituality by a list of do's and don'ts, now, the weakness of legalism is that it sees sins, individual actions, plural, but not sin, the root of the trouble, right? So you could think of that as a capital S, the condition of the heart. It judges by the outward and not the inward. Furthermore, the legalist fails to understand the real purpose of God's law and the relationship between law and grace. And that's what Paul's getting at here. Right? So we talked about grace in chapter 6. Now it's a concentration on the law. So let's look at Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, Right? So these are Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians in Rome uh, that are familiar with the Torah. Okay? How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. So we were having a good time and laughing, and then I had to start talking about adultery. So. <laughs> So to summarize this text, um, and here's the, here's the key. It's not really about um, adultery per se. So Paul starts here by identifying who he's addressing, those who know and care about the Torah, verse 1. This is the person who would raise this particular objection. So if we're justified by faith alone, then what was the role of the law supposed to be? 
The first question here has to do with the extent of the Torah's authority. The second question, addressed through the rest of this chapter, has to do with the point of the Torah. What was the law all about? What was it there for? What was Sinai all about? If it did not justify, then what was it for? Now, Paul's point here is that the Torah does not have authority over men who have died. Verse 1. We have to take care to follow him closely here because his illustration is a complex one. A woman is bound to her husband by the Torah as long as he is alive, but his death releases her. Verse 2. She is guilty of adultery if she marries another man while her first husband is still alive, but if he has died, then she is free to marry. Verse 3. In a similar way, we are dead to the Torah because of the body of Christ. Verse 4. This frees us to marry another, that one being Jesus, the one who rose from the dead. This was done so that we could be fruitful before God. Verse 4. When we were in the flesh, married to the old man, the Torah stirred up the motions of sins, and the result was, quote, fruit unto death. Verse 5. So now that we've remarried, we're delivered from the Torah, that condition in which we bore fruit to death, verse 6, the result is that we may now serve in newness of spirit, same verse 6, and not in the oldness of the letter. Okay? So Paul is really describing here the believer's relationship to the law, and then how, how are we going to apply our understanding of that relationship. In this, he's summing up all his contrast between the law and grace, works and faith, flesh and the spirit, Adam and Christ, death and life, profane versus holy, worldly versus godly, and sin versus righteousness. Uh, Paul Paul is not being misogynistic. Uh, he doesn't have anything against women. In fact, uh, he doesn't present that way, write that way, have that attitude anywhere in his writings, nor is that evident anywhere in the Bible. Uh, Paul is actually using this example and acknowledging a situation here whereby a woman is bound in a marriage to an undesirable character. And he's developing his argument in a way that does not dishonor the law. And he's going to win his argument for the sanctity of the gospel on grounds that are irrefutably legal. Okay. Mm -hmm. is, is the Torah, is that God's law or is that man's law? It is, it is, it is, it is the law that he gave to man. So, okay, so it's yeah, so it's just a, it's just a repeat of the, of the garden. Uh, in the garden, God gave a commandment. Um, you know, follow, obey and live, disobey and die. Okay, on Mount Sinai, same thing. He made a people for himself. He gives them the law, another set of of commandments, uh, and says, "Follow this law. I'll be your God." Straight from that, you get exile and death. Right, just like we got death and exile from the from the garden. So uh, it's obey and live, or curse God and die. It's always a it's always a binary choice. So, so Paul here is, is talking about laws from God, mm -hmm. not from the truck. Yeah, because people are because yeah, he's he's making the point that the Jewish nation has missed the point of the of the law and what it was all about, and that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Um, but, you know, just, just to be consistent with what Jesus said, the law has to be fulfilled. Um, so here's, here's the players in the plot. You've got one woman, two men, and they are in a prickly legal situation. Uh, we are the woman, right, the church, the believers, uh, and we were married to the old Adam, right? That's the first husband. Uh, and we were bearing fruit to death, right? So not just ugly babies, but deadly babies. Um, now, here's, here's something that if you're reading a commentary, a lot of commentaries will say the law, the Torah, uh, is the one who died, was the first husband. That's... Um, that's an incorrect understanding. Because the law is holy, righteous, and good, we'll see that in verse 12, and the law can't die. It's immaterial, right? Um, it is not alive. And so, do the Ten Commandments still apply? Yes. Um, 
Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength still applies, right? Love your neighbor still applies. Because Jesus himself said, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The law does not die, we do. Our old Adamic nature dies, we die to the law. The law has no power, has no reign. Um, but that old Adam nature that we've been talking about for a couple of chapters, it's got to die, right? Um, so that, that is part and parcel of the gospel, right? What, do you do, what does God do with a sinful human being? He kills him. And he gives him an entirely new life, resurrects him with Christ, right? That's, that is God's solution. Uh, the law is good. It's a good law. It does hold people to their promises, their covenants. Uh, even if that means uh, the, the, in the marriage, the woman is bound to a, a bad man, resulting in destructive ends. The law that kept, keeps us hitched to our first husband while not approving of that unfortunate situation. Okay? Uh, and a good law can mean that death results in death. Right? That's why we have capital punishment. So, to be free, our first husband has to die so we can remarry. And God's goal has always been a bride for his son, right? The theme is, has always been kill the dragon, get the girl, right? So if you like those kind of stories, King Arthur and his knights, the knight goes and battles the dragon, uh, that's, that's from the Bible, right? That's the entire story summed up. Satan, the dragon, gets killed, and Jesus gets a bride. So kill the dragon, get the girl. And, and what are the qualities of that bride? Not ugly and illegitimate, but beautiful, spotless, and holy. So it has to be an honorable, legal marriage that he can invite the whole world to behold. Um, the standards of righteousness do not go away. These truths are eternal. They may even be self-evident, to borrow a phrase from Thomas Jefferson. Uh, so we're talking about this idea of marriage unions and the fruit born of those unions. So we saw that in chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. In chapter 13, we're going to see that to fulfill the law, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this, saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no will to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans 13, 8 through 10. So what's the point of the law? God showing how one can get out from under the law while both the law and the person are still alive and still operating. Okay? Uh, that's Michael Pearl in his Romans verse by verse. And Romans chapter 8 verse 4 climaxes this argument uh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. So to be dead to the law does not mean that we lead lawless lives. It simply means that the motivation and dynamic of our lives does not come from the law. It comes from God's grace through our union with Christ. Having died and now been resurrected in Christ, who reigns as king, we are delivered from the authority of the law and now free to live out that law uh, in true service to God, bearing good fruit, walking in newness of life, and serving in newness of spirit. Sure. Can the living human being be the bride of Christ? We got. We got to be. Yeah, we are. Yeah, we, we are. are. We are still the bride. Of Christ. Yeah. The, the, the church. The church is the whole with the bride. Of Christ. Can, can I chime in? Now? Absolutely. Um, a good biblical reference, um, and you have to read it slow, or it. It won't make any read the book of Hosea. And Hosea takes Gomer and, and it tells about an illegitimate wife and how she's the heart. And that is a picture of not only God and Israel, but Christ and his church. And, and watch the language change from the first few chapters to the middle chapters of how it becomes uh, just the language changes and you can see how that illegitimate becomes the bride. 
and what she has to go through to be the bride of Hosea. But that's a, that's a good Old Testament picture of, of the church and, and Christ. And of course, Song of Solomon and uh, uh, the great love story, it's a perfect picture. As we... So the Jews who were still in Adam were bound to him by the Torah. The Gentiles who were in Adam were bound to him, Adam, by the law of the heavens, seen in every clear night sky. The Jews were bound by the Torah, the Gentiles by natural revelation, and the two of them together bore fruit to death. Now, of course, the Jews of the Old Testament who walked by faith, Hebrews 11, did not bear fruit to death, and that is because they were looking forward to Christ. And in the same way, the many Gentiles of the Old Testament who walked by faith did not bear fruit to death either. Men like Melchizedek, Jethro, and Naaman walked before God. And it's too easy for us to make a caricature of the old man. The fact that our first marriage resulted in so much death and despair should not make us think that it was cartoon evil. Our first husband did not rampage through brothels and taverns talking like a pirate. This kind of thing, of course, happens in a fallen world, but the really serious temptations came from our hurt first husband, that old Adam nature, and his respectable best. The kingdoms that came from him were glor glorious enough to present a significant temptation to the second Adam, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. And the angelic being who led the first Adam astray appears as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Recall that Paul is making this point over the objections of those who, quote, knew the law. They were better than the unwashed Gentiles, that was a given. They were chosen, they were religious, they were respectable, but they were just as married to Adam as anybody else. So in the passage, Paul contrasts these two husbands, death and life, fruit to death and fruit to life, and right at the end, spirit and letter. He does this elsewhere, and we do well to understand it. He is not condemning letters as such, because he wrote this contrast of spirit and letter with letters. But those who have those letters only are still married to the first Adam. Right? So if, if you just have the Bible perched on a shelf, never read it, never understand it, never, it's never written on the heart, um, still married to the first Adam. And the fruit to death they consistently bear proves it. But those who receive the letters of the New Testament and the Old in the power of the Spirit are not bibliologers. John chapter 5, verse 39. Now, I, I didn't know what a bibliologer was, so I had to look it up. Uh, an excessive love of books, uh, I'm, I'm in danger of that, uh, or an excessive adherence to the literal interpretation of the Bible. So, we don't really take the Bible as allegory, right? It's just some fanciful story because the Bible is true. Nor do we take the Bible literally. If that raises your hackles, let me give you an explanation. So, if you read Psalms, Jeremiah, Lamentation, you may come away with the idea that God is a uh, drunken man, uh, shouting, yelling, uh, he has feathers, uh, he's a lion and a bear, and he's shooting ang uh, arrows dipped in blood at my kidneys. All right? So if you take the Bible literally, that's what you come away with. No, we read the Bible and we take the Bible naturally, as it is written. Right? We see metaphor, we read metaphor. Right? We see um, straightforward statements, they are they are facts. They are truths. Can I, can I say something there? How many of you read Luke chapter 15 in the prodigal son? That's a parable. That particular prodigal had no name. Why? Because it wasn't one individual. It was multiple individuals throughout generations of time that had went through that same thing and circumstance that the prodigal. That's why the Lord used parables. Parable is just a simple story to a simple people. Why do they use that? So we can understand. And you tell a lot of people that, they're like, oh no. But if that's why we should study scripture. They don't like to hear that. But yes, it's a real person, but that 
but it was a representation of many people throughout time after time. But some people don't like to hear that, but that's the gospel. Right. Is that the general rule when you're reading the Bible that if it's not a name, specific name, it, it's probably referring to the, the overall people? Well, the name is probably zeroing in on specific that person, maybe. Well, it's it, it it can be both because there's different there's different yeah there's different levels of meaning. So just like the um, Jesus tells John to write these things to the church of Laodicea, that was not just for the church of Laodicea. It's definitely for us today. So and he says that at the end of every letter, um, you know, all the it's for this church, but all the churches are supposed to to hear it. And if you have ears, you just got to figure out what they're kind of. Going at have enough knowledge to figure it out because it's like I talked the other week on jawbone and Jesus that was referring to Jesus. So right. Jesus wasn't the jawbone, but that was referring to Jesus. Well, exactly. So to it out. Many exactly. people tried to put a parable to the to the story or the event of Jonah and the whale or, or Samson and, and all that. He he definitely names those by name, tells where they were from, where they were going, and that is definitely a real life event. Like this morning when I was preaching, I talked about the, the king who had made a great feast. That He said the, this parable, um, the pearl of great price, which is the church, all those things are representations of, 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 of things in our lives. And and just through studying, you'll know which ones is parables and which ones is the is as the events. So, so that's one thing. If, if you don't study the Bible and then you just walk around trying to tell everybody, well, that ain't so, and you don't know why they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. You've got to study the Bible. But you know, it's the Bible. Bible. Want it's just ain't going study to thyself right. to show thyself approved. That's what God gives us. We can go on a lot of things, Granny said. But nine times out of ten, what Granny said ain't always in the good book. Brother Ron Rudd, I wish he was here. There was there was a story he tells. He was talking to a guy, and he just rattles off this this verse, and he goes, "It's in there." <laughs> and Brother Robert Norman said, "Well, I, I ain't never read that verse in there, but but you know, we need to know ourselves why why we do this or why we believe that." And, and that's why we study. And I'm whatever that you just said. I'm, I'm a bibliolater. Yeah, I'm a bibliolater. Yeah. Yes, I'm one of those. So. Yeah, that's a. I had to repent of something. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> yeah. um, when the spirit is at work in us, we'll bear fruit organically. Right, it just comes naturally. But if when you try to grow apples, the trunk shakes and the branches clank and smoke, something's obviously wrong. We're here to serve, that's true, in verse 6, but we serve in newness of spirit. This is life. This is regeneration. This is grace and mercy and peace. This is, this is righteousness hanging heavy on the branches given to us. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. We're not talking about crawling over the broken glass of rules for the Spirit. Our first marriage was full of turmoil, but now we are invited to be at peace. Um, so does everybody kind of understand that analogy? First husband had to die. Um, the law is satisfied. Now we are free to be joined with Jesus. So if you understand that analogy... Um, well then, and you can relate it to what Paul's been talking about so far in Romans, uh, then you have bested most theologians and more than 99% of professing Christians. So congratulations. Um, if, if, you ever, if you ever want uh, an interesting exercise, and I'll tell you from studying chapter 7, this has theologians and com commentators, commenters, um, those who write the commentaries, all twisted up and conflicted. Um, and in this next section, um, it, it gets worse uh, because they, they get all puzzled as in the next few verses. Well, is Paul talking about Paul? Is he talking about Paul before the Damascus Road? Or is he talking about Paul after the Damascus Road? Or is he talking about somebody else? Is he talking 
about Jews or Gentiles or who in the world is Paul talking about. So we'll figure that out, Lord willing, next time. So. I've got a question. Yeah. You kind of confused me a little bit. All right, now, is what we're sitting right here in, are we the bride of Christ right now? Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to ask is the people that's in the millennium on earth, so they're the bride of Christ. That's where I was wondering, or is the bride of Christ have to be in heaven. We'll, we'll be the we we'll be in the millennium. Yeah. So if we survive. No, so, we'll, no, we'll be. <laughs> we, 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 we'll we'll rule and reign. The Bible says as kings and priests. So whether we want to think we are, so we're going to come out of heaven and be there. But there's going to be live people there. And you're going to rule over them. Okay. And they're, but they're still the bride of Christ. The so same. They have children that the same. Saved. The same. Yeah. The same will be. Yeah. Okay. The, so the ones that are born the, and they're sinners, they're the, not. The bride of the. Still sinners. Yeah. The bride of Christ concept is the church. It is just another name for the church, for the body of believers. Uh, okay, so yeah. And who's who's going? Who's going when? You know, it depends on pre meal, post meal. Or meal and meal just depends on on where you are. But you know, for for us, we're most familiar with the with the premillennial concept that the rapture takes the present church out. Uh, we are we are in a state where we don't have bodies, right? But we are we are in heaven. That's what happens. Same that happens when we die. Um, but eventually, we have got to come back and pick up our bodies, just like Jesus. There was nothing in that tomb because he had his glorified body. We got to get one too because we have to be like him and so whenever he you know puts the legos back together and gives us that glorified body that's you know that that millennium that's the thousand years of peace that christians love to fight about so, um, <laughs> but but the whenever it talks of that concept of the bride of christ that is the church right and that's that's what we're doing right now um so salvation itself has has three tenses, right? So the past, we're justified. The present, we're being sanctified. He's working on us. He's polishing us up. He's getting us ready. Uh, and then glorification, right? That is the that is the the final final tense. And it's all happened right now because it just like uh, we were we died with Christ on the cross. Us, we were buried. We were, we were resurrected with Him. We ascended with Him. That's where we are now. So it's a, you know, it's hard to wrap our head around. But as far as God is concerned, once we believe, all of that has already happened. It's a done deal. We win, they lose. Well, what, what kind of confusion is that? I always thought like that. That we're the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. But then I thought well, maybe I was wrong about. It. Maybe I'm not thinking about that. Maybe I have to be in heaven, have to be dead and in heaven with the glorified body to be considered the bride of Christ. Maybe because of my sins, I can't be that. See what I'm saying? If I'm here sinning, I you, cannot be that. You would? Are we still recorded? I mean, you you you'd be a good Catholic, right? <laughs> so so that's. That's why they, uh, they, you know, you got to go to mass. You got to, you got to have just said mass before you die. The priest has got to come in, make sure everything's wiped clean right before you take your last breath. And yeah, that's that's what they're all worried about. Um, thank God we don't we don't have to worry. But it is it is done. It was it was all taken care of on the cross, and our our destiny. Um, we're going to get into that um, about predestination. Predestination is not about the beginning. It's about where we're going. It's about what God has prepared. He prepared it way back in Eden. But just like we started talking about, we have taken this detour, but that remains our our destiny. So when we got saved, we were the bride of Christ. Right? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And y'all pray for Brother Casey. I know we're in chapter 7 for a bit longer, but chapter 8 is that's deep water. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he needs your prayers, and I know he'll do fine at it. But uh, not only the, the premillennial 
mid trip and post trip. That's that's the the next big argument in amongst God's people is predestination. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm rooting for you. It's gonna get better, right? Most <laughs> most most of the time in teaching, yeah, you know, we get through. Uh, a lot of teachers are run straight through six and seven because it's Paul talking about the law and you know it's, it's some of his examples. It's a little tough, and you know I, I would do that that I want to do, but I don't do it, and it just it make your head spin. So they want to make a beeline for the end of chapter eight, um, where we can't be separated from the love of God, and then we get right past that, and we're talking about predestination and the elect, and uh, the Calvinists are, are hurraying, and people who read the Bible are saying. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what that says. So, so we're gonna we're gonna try to figure that out. You know, I've been thinking about studying that, and then I can't keep shying away from it because I know it's gonna ruffle feathers anywhere you go with that. One, I think about Calvinism. Yeah, yeah. So we'll. You know, you either you either with it or you ain't. I guess. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I have some things I read about it. I studied it a little bit. I think yeah, that makes sense, and then. 